We want to welcome you to our Leavenworth City Commission study session. We ask that you turn on for silence all cell phones. Our meetings are televised every day on Channel 2 at 6 p.m. and at midnight, also available for viewing on YouTube. Uh, at this study session, we have four items. Our first item on the agenda is a semi-annual report from University of St. Mary's. Hello, Sister Diane. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Go Spires. We hope. You hope. Well, thank you. We have moved to a, another season. We graduated um, about two weeks ago. We graduated 174 students. Okay. Um, we are. We also had graduation in December and graduated 75 students because of the um, when our doctorate in physical therapy finished their program. So we now have two graduations, which. We're pushing it because we were we were maxing out at a thousand eight hundred chairs. So, wow! So, but that's it, it's always a fun time. We were able to celebrate. I think you're aware it was in our paper that we lost a senior in January that was driving back, and so we had an honorary degree for him that was accepted by his parents and family. So it was a a somber graduation as uh, we were able to award that degree. But we are grateful that we could celebrate with them and have lunch with them and give the students a chance to be with them as well, the students who couldn't go to the funeral. Um, we'll also have a crowd here for reunion for June 8, 9, and 10 is our alumni reunion. Um, we're celebrating our 100th year reunion, yeah. so lots of folks are coming back, and we're picking up classes that weren't able to come because of COVID. Um, so we should have a, and we have those who like the nostalgia of staying in the dorms, and the rest will, who are, think that's, you know, I've done that. Thank you all. They'll be in the hotels. <laughs> um, our family nurse practitioner is going to have a change. We're going to be able to make that more of a hybrid program and take it partly online um, so that you can do the didactic part or book learning, if you will, um, online, and then you'd come to campus for the, the clinicals and the lab settings. Um, those still happen at St. John's. He's our very good neighbor, Wes, there. That that's where those happen. Uh, in the old surgery room, we're very grateful that we finally got our master's in social work through the, we needed a legal change that happened, oh, 10 days ago, finally. Um, as the, we are, it's also under the uh, KBR at Kansas Bureau of, Kansas Board of Behavioral Sciences, which sets the rules for who can take the test and who can't to be licensed. Um, so we finally had to get a uh, governmental legislative fix for that so that students can take our program, which is fully online. So uh, very excited about that because we're shutting out our own Kansas residents who so badly need health care, especially in the rural parts of the state. So it, it has now opened all of that up. So we're very excited about that. Probably the big news on our campus is we are going to build a new residence hall on the north end of campus. Um, we have been short space, uh, so we have built out the ground floor of Maria. Um, we put 24 rooms down there. The sisters moved out of the third floor of Mead. We put 16 students up there, and now we've taken over the guest area, and we've put 16 more students okay. there, and I'm out of nooks and crannies. <laughs> yeah. um, so the, the new dorm will hold about 48 students. So very excited about that. And um, those of you who ever walk our campus um, know that we have a grotto there, a grotto to Mary from the Lord's tradition. And uh, it, it was badly in need of repair, both the statue and the ground around it. Um, it it's stone and the moss grew on it, and then it would just be a hazard. Um, so praying became hazardous. So um, that's getting fixed. Great. So uh, very excited about that. They started that construction as well. Um, we usually have two seasons on campus. You know, sometimes they say that there's only yellow cone season uh, in the summer. Well, we have maintenance season in the in the middle of summer, so we're also in the middle of tuck pointing our old buildings um, to help help them. And then the following year, we'll replace those roofs. I don't think they've ever been replaced, so that's a little bit of a challenge there. Uh, Maria's also getting some love. Uh, it needs the shower drains fixed. All of those things that must be done that. No one sees unless they aren't done. <laughs> so uh, a lot of that kind of stuff happening this summer, but very excited about it. Um, summer is, the summer sessions are all in session, so on campus is a physical therapist, the occupational therapist, 
um, the athletic training students. Uh, and then we keep about, oh, there's about 20 students that stay on campus. That it's just better for them to uh, stay with us or else they have no place to go. So they stay with us. And for the most part, they, um, we put them to work and they work off the, the cost of staying in the dorm. So we give them some extra little jobs there. Um, we're very excited. We now have a, we're forming a new partnership with the downtown. And so uh, as we're building this out, it's for our orientation um, with the Main Street people. And so next uh, August, second week in August, we'll take all of our freshmen to downtown. Um, and the merchants are all cooperating and celebrating us. This way, hopefully, our students will know all the things you can do in downtown Leavenworth. Um, we want to actually get them here. We want to bring them down to some of the festivals. And, you know, they're going to actually have little, you know, games they do to get them in the different stores. Mm -hmm. So we're very excited about that. Uh, and I'm hoping that once we get them, and they know what's downtown, that we can get them here more often, mm -hmm. rather than losing them to the legends. Yeah. So hopefully they'll uh, get to experience some of the treasures of our downtown area. As well as, you know, just they don't know the river is right there, and just kind of explore what it means to be in Love North. So very excited about that. Um, and our uh, track team has taken what we call the Triple Crown. So they won in conference, they won cross country, the con cross country uh, conference, they won the indoor track, and they just won the outdoor track. Um, so they'll be headed to nationals for the third time. We love it, but it's a little yeah. expensive um, in another week. So they're doing very well. Um, we're looking for growth on our main campus next year. So we're excited about that as well. And so that's my quick update, but I'm open to your questions and what questions you have. Do you have special projects you're doing in Fort Leavenworth that you're getting ready for? I yes. Just, I know there was some discussion, but I didn't know if you We have several um, partnerships going with uh, Fort Leavenworth. Uh, we are very excited that we now have one of the um, Hiring Our Heroes. Yes. And he is he's wonderful. It's like, okay, how many more of these can I get? Um, he is just an asset, and if I just got to figure out how I can keep him. Um, and we also are working with their, um, the libraries are now sharing things. Um, it's Dr. Metzinger, our provost, who is in the middle of that partnership. Uh, as they continue to build out, how can we work together? Um, as two universities sitting in town, that only makes sense. Sure. So I think they're continuing to figure out how we can better do that. Um, as Once we get our students back, um, the general is going to come out and speak to them. Um, and also bring with them their recruiting people because we would love more of our kids to be in ROTC. Um, it's a win-win. Uh, it's good for our kids. It's good for the nation. Um, provides some structure for them, and it also provides, hopefully, some tuition support. So, yeah, we're looking forward to, to building that and continuing to work that uh, forward. I have one more question, and then I'll let somebody else talk. Then, they when I was there, we had several foreign exchange or international students. Do you have still have quite a few international students that attend St. Mary's from other countries? That we do, but exchange? it's not exchange. So we have students right now from we have one from Egypt, Canada, um, the UK, Honduras, Jamaica, um, and Ecuador. Um, okay. Usually, they're the, the kids coming from the southern hemisphere are soccer players. Oh, okay, okay. Yes, and generally they are. Um, sometimes people have this illusion that all international kids have a lot of money. They don't. Mm -hmm. They're looking oh, for a way no. out. <laughs> no. Yeah, so we often end up helping them as well. Mm -hmm. All great. they have to do is tell me their story, and mm -hmm. I have a bleeding heart. <laughs> so yeah, it's. Uh, but it's it's wonderful to have that mix of students and different it is. cultures. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, only thing I just wanted to say, man, great job with the students at the uh, uh, that's on campus. I've seen uh, quite a few of them working in the downtown businesses, and anytime I get a chance to connect with them, you know, it always uh, it's a joy. I just tell them, man, they're very well mannered and they know how to conduct themselves in public, and so definitely want to give credit to you on that as well too. They're amazing. Well, thank you. We have quite a few at the Italian restaurant in town. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's five there right now. So that's good. Oh, great that's customer good. service. And I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, for coming out and being part of our First Generation program. Oh, yes, ma'am. You've been quite an inspiration. He comes out and speaks for, to our students. Appreciate it. Sister, where, did, where do you go, St. Mary's go, to students? Um, most of our, I can tell you where they end up coming from. <laughs> 
So the majority of our students are still from Kansas. Mm -hmm. um, so we do Kansas, Missouri, uh, Oklahoma, Texas, California are the biggest ones. Mm -hmm. And then we have a scattering of, I have no idea how they found us. Mm -hmm. But the majority of our kids are still Kansas kids. I think we're still about 60% Kansas. You try to incorporate alumni into that and have them make, mm -hmm. bring your sons and daughters, make them legacy. You know, I have to tell things. you, sir, I'm now feeling very old because the students I taught, <laughs> their students, are their sons and daughters are now there. So I, I am feeling kind of like the grandmother. But it, it's, it's wonderful to see the young men and women that I taught when I was teaching there, that now their students, their daughters, sons and daughters are at St. Mary. That's cool. That is, it's that, uh, that legacy program. Yeah, that that sense of this is I had a great experience here, and this is where I want my students yes. to come. So yes, we 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 try to work our alums as well. I had dinner in St. Louis with an alum, and she's my guess is in her mid seventies, and she has a great niece that she's trying to get to St. Mary. Oh, awesome! So it's when people have had a good experience, they want to share it. Awesome, uh, Commissioner Martin. You have any questions or comments? No, no, I, I do appreciate the report out. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the information. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you all very much for your support of St. Mary. Yeah, thank you as well. Very grateful. Thank, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, second item on the agenda, update on project progress and funding for American Rescue Plan Act, Harper funding. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor and Commission, uh, I just want to give an update. I know we've, we did a, a number of ARPA updates, uh, funding and projects. Um, over the last year or so, and it's been a little while, uh, but everything's moving well. I don't really need any guidance, but I kind of want to go through where we are. i just run through these real quick to give uh, the public and the commission an update. So the sewer plan improvements obviously was the, the majority of the funding. That was a little over $3 million. You'll see the middle column there is, is what's been expend, uh, expended to this uh, to date. So number one was the bar screen replacement. That equipment was ordered. I think there was a 20-week lead on the equipment. We ordered this some months ago, so it should be here uh, just about any time. Um, and that was the smallest ticket item of the three that we were going to repair, so that should be in. The biggest ticket item, the trickling filter replacement, um, we should put that out to bid now anytime, probably maybe by the end of this week. So we have those big trickling filters, the big um, oval-shaped or round-shaped um, pieces. They have a filter media that stretches from the top to the bottom, and within that filter media, our arms and mechanical elements, those are original to 1972 when the plant opened. We actually need to replace three. They're about $2 million a piece. Uh, but one right now is non-functional, and that's the one we're replacing. And then, so at some point in the not too distant future, the filter media and trickling filters two and three uh, are going to need to be replaced. But um, right now they're functioning um, okay, and we're working on that one. So that'll go out to bid. Um, and then construction is fall on that. And then the final thing was replacement of the belt press. Um, as you remember, maybe we're transitioning to what's called a screw type press. It's mm -hmm. just the way that you compress um, the material. So think about it, rather than compressing it, it rings it and screws it. That's just um, indicative of best practices now is the screw press is more efficient um, uh, for over the long term. That's about a $700,000 to $750,000 um, issue and that has uh, the word for the design of that is next week so you'll see that before the commission and bg consultants can give you some more information so those projects they take a little time because they're pretty complex but those are all moving very well and should be expended by the time the ARPA funds uh, need to be fire truck replacements been ordered uh, approved and ordered by the commission refuse program change set aside approved and ordered so um, that is the poly gardens <coughs> and uh, expenses related to that uh, fire suppression and ADA grants, we have given one out, and there are several others interested uh, parties in the program. We have quotes from some business owners who have, it's really spurred uh, business owners to find architects and engineers who do this type of work and share it amongst themselves, which was a problem. So a lot of activity, and I expect to see um, that activity ramp up here um, pretty quickly. Woman Center upgrades, that one came in well under budget, which is a good thing. Uh, that was the rebuilt kiddie pool, main, uh, rebuilt all the main pool pumps, refurbishing all the adult pool features, um, and those are complete and should be ready for opening a woman pool. 
Uh, the traffic calming pilot project, the project concept was approved by the commission. Final bid documents are being drift, uh, drafted now and bids expected um, here this summer. We talked about that at a study session last month. Uh, City Hall condensate piping replacement. Uh, we're working with the mechanical contractor on the project specifications. Um, the 300000 is about half. That's replacing all of the condensate piping in City Hall. That was not done in the renovation in the early 2000s, and most of that dates back 75 to 100 years, most of the piping in the building. Um, radio, police radio encryption, that was back in July of 22, approved and ordered. City Hall HVAC unit, um, back in September of 22, approved and uh, ordered. Actually, that's approved, ordered, and um, uh, is being installed. The housing project, that was the project with Sister Vicky. Again, that one was approved, and the level of detainable housing. They rezoned 728 Pottawatomi. They already purchased one structure, so they're moving forward on all of their projects. The youth-related program relates to the contract with um, Big Brothers Big Sisters, and so that came in a little bit under what we had allocated. Funding and contract approved, um, and I believe that they have a public meeting coming up um, in June. June 9th. June 9th, and we'll get some information out about that. They're going to host, I think, at the community center. Uh, to give, uh, They're going to do three community meetings on one day at three different times during the day, so anybody has the opportunity to go. And we'll put out more information about that uh, here in the next couple of days. Relocation of the RFCC offices. Um, the... Uh, staff has selected SANS construction um, on the design on a construction bid, and that, that hasn't come to the commission yet, so you'll see all that, the design and the contract um, here in, in probably in the third quarter. And then finally, we have the, the project that was dependent upon funding, and that was a Wilson Avenue widening project. We did get some really good news from uh, Zephyr out there, and so we'll share that in the next couple of weeks. Okay. And so that uh, expansion of that business um, is good, and uh, moving forward in a positive manner, and we're looking at some ribbon cuttings and some um, events out there to celebrate the expansion of that business. So you'll see here that was not funded. We were we didn't have $1.125 million left. The, the commission did approve a design contract, so we don't have the final engineer's estimate yet. But this was some sort of, um, as projects start coming in, hopefully under budget, and we have a little bit left over, we'll see how much we have. The 388 is the shortfall. So right now, the actual uh, cash available, our expected cash available, is seven hundred thirty-six thousand nine hundred eighty-seven dollars and nine cents, which is basically um, the forecasted budgeted amount minus the shortfall. So we're we're three quarters of the way there on the estimated costs anyway, which is a good sign. That's um, a project that I think the commission was favorable to as we tried to help Willis and our Zephyr. Um, with that Wilson Avenue project to be able to really expand their business and the work that they do back there, um, the investment that they're making. So that's where we are right now. Um, as projects continue to come in um, and costs are known, we'll have a better idea on Wilson Avenue. And once that design is done, we'll have a better idea on the uh, cost estimates that the consultant comes up with that. So um, everything's moving well and, and looking good uh, cost-wise and certainly open to any questions that you have. I appreciate the update. Uh, any questions from the commission? That was self-explanatory. Yeah. Yeah. I did. I have a question. Um, on the, uh, I'm just curious, and I don't know if you'll know or not, on the first piece that you said those, uh, with the trickling filter replacement, and they're like $2 million? I mean, right. is, that, uh, is that just because of the... Um, so, I mean, it's extremely large and extremely custom. Okay. Um, it, they're the giant holding tanks. Right. And from the top to the bottom, they have a um, very dense mesh media, mm -hmm. and they degrade over time. But also, once you take that out, there's all the, um, all the welding and all the uh, mechanical pieces within inside that. Um, the arm that moves around top, all that will have to be replaced. And essentially, you're completely rebuilding the entire uh, trickling filter. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And Thank these you. ones have you know, lasted 50 uh, right. plus years. Right, right. So it's just so not one piece, right. it sounds like That's it's... That's right. Yeah, they just in, degrade in, over time. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah, and I don't think we're going to have a problem with spending the funding just with all of these projects, but uh, the deadline is next year, correct? To have them obligated. Okay. Obligated yeah. by the end of 24 and spent by the end of 25. Okay. Right. Hmm. Uh, any questions, Commissioner Morton? Uh, no, sir. Uh, Mayor Wilson, I, I, no, I appreciate the update, uh, Mr. Kramer, and, and um, yeah, I, I kind of like having these updates on, on these numbers uh, throughout the year, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. 
Appreciate you, Paul. There's no other questions. Uh, move on to item number three, uh, Havens Park Traffic Flow Review. Commissioners, good evening. Good to be here with you. Um, as you know, recently, uh, here over the past several years, we've been adding trail out at Havens Park. Um, in the last two years, we've had just under 2,000 linear feet of asphalt trail, mm -hmm. uh, bringing our, our asphalt trail total uh, to just over a mile at the park. And then there's countless, uh, we haven't measured it out yet, the, the, the mountain biking and hiking trails. Um, that have been put at the park by the trail mob with Chris Hendrickson and, and, his, and the volunteer group. Uh, so a lot of growth out there, and we've, we've reached the point where um, we've, we've kind of finished the corridor. Brian, if you pull up the, the next slide. So um, this is an overhead of what I'll just call the sections that, that's all the trails. Um, with, with the exception of at, at the top is, is that, that gray area, the gray line with the circle in, that is the roadway um, that, that goes through it. So vehicular <coughs> traffic is on that. Uh, the dark lines are all paved trails. The hash line uh, heading around the circle is the, uh, is the trail that we, asphalt trail we installed last year. And then the solid line um, leading uh, down there to Shawnee is the asphalt trail that we've installed this year and has since been completed. So the reason we're here tonight is we've we've pretty much completed that roadway corridor for an asphalt trail. So so as Brian and I um, met out on site, it's it's time to think about putting a trailhead in. And when we talk about a trailhead, um, generally what I'm what I'm talking about is, is is a starting point for for people on bikes, for people hiking, things like that. Things that generally go along with the trailhead include signage. Uh, letting people know the distance of different trails, uh, possibly the difficulty of trails, which which will probably occur here because there's quite a bit of slope in this park, um, and then and then as well as there's usually some sort of, of vehicular um, management to keep vehicles and and um, pedestrians and bikers from from having interactions. So really, that's the main um, topic of discussion that Brian and I are bringing forward to you tonight is, is what makes the most sense, where makes the most sense to put this trailhead in at, out, at, out at the Havens Park. Now that we have additional trail out there, we have our new restroom on site, um, what makes the most sense? And, and we're bringing forth a recommendation that, that we see that makes a lot of sense. Um, Brian, if we go back to the original one. So, so as I mentioned, the uh, the gray the gray line through there is active roadway, and where we're talking about putting the uh, trailhead is basically at the top of the road, um, just up from the new restroom facility. You got a is there a cursor on that, Brian? Yeah, let me try this here. And, and we'll and we'll show zoomed in here in a little bit, but I wanted to show you the um, big picture. We can. Um, so as you head up the road, okay, yeah, just go on to the next slide then. And as you head up, to, so the restroom, this is the entrance off of Ottawa. You're heading up into the park, and then as you turn right onto that roadway up there, that would be where the trailhead would be. And in our thought process, this is, this is looking at it from the restroom. So just to the right of the trucks up there, you see where um, uh, the road turns right, there's, there's a natural... Um, not natural, man-made uh, retention, concrete retention wall right there. We will help use that um, for some of the vehicular traffic as well as, as, well as install um, some, ball, some bollards and, and some, some natural vehicle control measures, which we'll get into here a little bit later. Uh, that would be the spot where, where we, would, um, we would call that a trailhead. We would put, we would put signage in that area um, and showing different lengths of, of trail sections, different difficulties, and such things as that. This slide here really shows the area very well. Um, at the top of the screen there, that roadway, that is Ottawa Street. To the right, that is 22nd Street coming up the hill. Mm -hmm. So you enter in through the park, um, heading from the top of this screen down, which would be heading from north to south, with the restroom on your left-hand side. And uh, as you reach to the top, the uh, um, 
the trailhead would be right there. Right here. Yes, correct. Yeah, yes, nice. just to the left of the top of that, that roadway. Our thought process is 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 um, we'd be able to open up the old roadway that heads out to 22nd there as, as for vehicular traffic flow mm -hmm. where people could come through and, and drive um, right back out onto, onto 22nd. That roadway has been closed since I started working here 20 years ago, but it's still in really good shape. It's just a matter of opening some gates and doing some, some tree work um, in-house. So why the, why the trailhead at this location? Um, when we looked at when we looked at the site, there's really in our in our minds, Brian and I talked about it, in our minds. There's four really really good reasons to put it here. First, the obvious one is the proximity to the new restroom. It's just up the hill from it. You're able to park at the new restroom and walk right up and start on the trails. Um, second, what we would do is is the old roadway would become part of the trail system and get incorporated with the rest of the trail, pretty much completing various loops. Um, um, so, we, so, so you're adding trail length just by doing this, the length of that trail, which is about, or that roadway, which is about adding about 17, 1800 feet of trail right there. Um, another, another very positive aspect of, of closing off beyond this point for vehicular traffic is, is the mountain biking and, and hikers and, and the interaction with vehicles driving on this. You see, uh, th this roadway is relatively flat. It's easily traversed um, for 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 people of all abilities. You see a lot of people parking on along there and just walking on the road. Um, this would give a stretch of trail in Havens Park that is extremely accessible. We would we would be able to to put some on street parking up there. Um, so so you know you could if you could have a a van accessible um, you know vehicle and, and offload right on there and you're on flat ground and you could traverse that that whole stretch of roadway uh, so that is that is that in my mind that's probably the the biggest the biggest positive of, of incorporating the roadway into the trail system is it becomes the only accessible portion of trail in the park which is which is which is really really big for us so, so what you see there, the dots there, those, those kind of represent where some control vehicle control measures would be. Uh, we wouldn't do fencing. We would do something more natural, um, such as um, um, native stones and stuff. Brian, if you want to go down to the next one, I'll let you talk about um, some of the research you've, or things you've looked at on these. All right. So... Um, as you see in the picture there, the big boulders, um, it's a natural look through for that area because that's a pretty natural park, natural setting. Um, so it would blend in nice, it, it looked nice. Um, having those boulders stretch out through some of the grass um, and then having a, a special barrier like that um, ballard there um, would allow for us to maintain the park, pull the ballards out so we can maintain the park. Um, Allow, allow accessibility for emergency That's vehicles and so yeah. forth. <clears throat> um, and these are very common on bikeways and trails and, and paths throughout the country. Um, so so we, we really wanted to keep it, you know, a natural, um, clean look to the park. Um, so that's what we thought we'd use for some, some of that. Um, the next slide is <clears throat> kind of what our trailhead sign would look like. Um, it show this is just an example. Um, it show the trails, um, the map of the trails, the accessibility of the trails. Uh, it might talk a little bit of the history of the park, as well as um, different plants and, and nature, um, birds and stuff that you might find in the park as well. So um, it kind of you know ties the whole thing together. Um, we get a lot of bird watchers out there. Um, there's a lot of different trees um, people like to look at and. And uh, so, it's a it's a pretty unique park um, as far as nature goes. So that that's the type of sign we look at for the trailhead. Yeah, and, and we we could have individual maps, and we'll we'll do some more mapping on the the mountain biking and and hiking trails. Um, the trail mob hasn't done a lot of that to this point, um, but but we will we will include um, some of that, um, and with the. Uh, um, with with this trailhead information, people go up to this trail. They know the distance of each each direction they're going, how far they want to go, 
um, some of the slope. This uh, the park has uh, quite a bit of slope to it. Mm -hmm. um, you, if, once you get off that bottom stretch, if if you decide to go up, you better you better you better be in pretty good shape if you're if you're walking. Um, so. It's not a permanent change to a park, you know. It's a it's a thought process mm -hmm. making this a, a lot of a lot of foot traffic, a lot of hiking and biking and trails. Trails are so so popular. It's a relatively inexpensive um, way to manage uh, a beautiful piece of property. Um, you know, there's some costs with with getting the stones and the bollards and the sign made, of of course. Um, but there's not huge infrastructure going in on this. It, um, we it's it's just an absolute beautiful piece of property it, it really mm -hmm. is and 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 to be able to control uh, vehicles and, and vehicle and, and hiker and biker interactions I think I think from a safety standpoint is, is extremely important also uh, I've seen a lot of mountain bikers coming down those trails um, pretty fast also um, so that's that's our thought process uh, we want to we think we're at a point where now where we're ready to put a trailhead in somewhere and, and in our minds, um, it makes a lot of sense to put it um, down there in that area um, for all the reasons that, that we've mentioned. So with that, unless Brian has anything to add, I'll, I'll open it up for discussion, thoughts, questions, anything you might have. Well, I think that seemed to be the natural spot. I mean, the, the, the road goes up and then it ends there. Correct. It goes right or left. And and so but ha having a little bit of extra parking up there might be good, too, because there's not that many uh, parking spaces at the at the um, uh, bathrooms, but um, you're right about. I mean, it has some steep parts, but you can go two different directions. You can go straight up the hill, or you can go wind around. So it is very accessible to to everybody. I think. Um, I, I you know I think that making it safer. So I mean, we've we've called the police when we've seen trucks tear around in there and tear I mean what you're spending in fixing all that too is is uh, you'd be saving saving some of that um, and then tearing some of the horses and other things tearing up the trails because you can't stop the horses I guess from coming in but except that it's against the law but um, but um, I don't know there's just so many so many reasons we've seen people we've seen homeless people living in cars up there and we've seen what drug paraphernalia and that sort of thing. I just think you're going to see a lot less of that if you aren't able to have cars up in that area. So I think it's a great idea, and I'm glad you came up with it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks for the update. Uh, I'm just curious to learn more about the history of Havens Park. Like, what's the size of it? And then at one point, I know it used to be a go kart trail. Uh, when did that change? Yeah. And this is go for back to the, the public very second awareness. slide. So I, it's I'm there. I'm, Still there. I'm pretty sure it's 65 acres, Mayor. Uh -huh. um, so see up top there, the thing looks like a little racetrack. Yeah, that is still it's still up there today. Uh -huh. uh, that the asphalt is still there from the old goat track, or the goat go kart track. Um, I raced go karts there. A lot, a lot of people, a lot of people did back in the day, and the, and there was a lot of fun had up there. And um, it's very difficult to get to now with some of the rock outcroppings and stuff the, with some erosion over time uh -huh. um, you, there's a lot of rock up up top there um, because of that pass it's made it a little difficult to to keep vehicular traffic out of the park yeah because that a lot of people grew up with that mindset well, we used to ride a go-kart or yeah. mo you know mini bikes or, or whatever through the park and um, once you start building trails and inviting people on on bicycles and mountain bikes and hiking um, then those kind of interactions between between motorcycles and things like that become very become undesirable pretty quick. Yeah, um, but it make yeah. a great camping pad though. I mean, it's the shape and size of it and everything. It's on a flat area all by itself. There would be yeah. good camping. So we think about like the for Boy Scouts or whatever. So we think yeah. the change took place what maybe about 20, 30 years ago. When it was no longer used as a go kart trail, and the reason that I'm asking because I had oh someone no, it's longer ago than that. Yeah. They were asking, inquiring, how come they're unable to ride go karts up there anymore? 
Well, so that's, that's why I'm asking. That was Mayor, that was <laughs> way before my... I've been here... Tw- was, I'm going on 20... So that's why I'm asking. Going on 21 years. I'm and, really old, so I know the answer to all of that. I, I know it was pretty overgrown and had been abandoned as a go-kart track for many okay. years many when years. I started here. And that was twenty oh, going on 21 years ago. Right. Um, I'm not sure how long ago that was, but... Uh, well, in the in the 70s, there, there, all those roads that went through there were open. And there were a lot of cars coming and going, but there was a lot of of uh dirt bikes and stuff that were tearing up the place and and you know just i mean it was just you know, man's land the police didn't like to go up there you know and and it was it just got to be more and more difficult until eventually they totally closed the park right. Right. for many years old, for now many those years. old road beds have have kind of le- uh, leaned themselves into being pretty good trail beds yeah and that's that's where uh, the center one and everything we just paved in the last two years those those are the old, the old road beds so it didn't take a lot of dirt work and a lot of mm-hmm. grading at the beginning which is why we were able to get further and, and stretch the dollars a little bit longer on how far we can go with the trails Appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the update. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Commissioner Martin? Uh, yeah, I appreciate that, um, Mayor Wilson. Uh, Mr. Gann, I do appreciate you putting the information together. I, I still think that Haven <laughs> Park is probably um, still one of the best kept secrets we have in, in uh, Leavenworth, you know, on uh, the, the trail and everything. I think it's the closest thing we've got to, you know, to Weston. And um, so <laughs> my family and I love it up there. And um, as far as the trailhead goes, I definitely like the uh, your idea on um, keeping it where we can, you know, have uh, the van accessibility um, keys come into play. So uh, you, you guys already do a good job of uh, kind of figuring some of that out, and, and I appreciate it. But uh, no, I appreciate the update, and I'm excited to see if we can generate some more interest up there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Got a comment? I'm uh, like you. A lot of this was long before my time. Down the lower right hand corner, you can see all what looks like road beds and stuff like that. Is that where you were talking about the go kart so, track? The go kart track, but you said it was up top. No. So, that right there is the old go kart track. Okay. That is the actual asphalt from yep. it. Yep. And I was right going to say, I don't remember yeah. that at all. Yeah. That's There's incorporated, it. this is a very steep slope. Uh, coming up here and then and then a very oh. steep slope coming up again and incorporated in, in all those slopes are all the mountain bike trails and hiking and biking trails that the trail mob has put in. These are just, again, what Commissioner Bowder was referring to, some of the old roadways that used to go through the huh. park. Yeah. Um, and you can still see some of the clearing from them, um, which if, if we were to go and add um, asphalt trail again in this park in the future, some of those top old road beds is where we would probably go next. It would make the most sense. Um, we'll have a, a study session either probably later on this year or the first part of next year where we want to spend the, the CIP dollars for trail next year, whether we want to head to another park or whatever. That's a different discussion. Um, but that's what those, those uh, trails that you see there. Mm-hmm. Well, and when, um, when, we had, um, when we had go-karts up there 22nd, not 22nd, but you know the steep hill over by you, Choctaw. Yeah. Shawnee. Shawnee. Yes. Shawnee. Shawnee. Right. Not Correct. Shawnee. Yeah. Shawnee went straight up the hill. That was the way you went to the go to the golf, go, go to the go kart track, is go up the hill and then come around. And you had, those aren't even there anymore. Okay. So, I mean, you That's can't get to right. it from there we anymore. See it. Okay. But, but you could. It was easier to get in that way than any other way. Yeah, the very, very bottom right corner is the. Um, is the intersection of, of the top of Shawnee Hill. Right the bottom, there, there yes, you, correct. The bottom okay. right-hand corner of that. That's the very top of the hill, Shawnee, right where it meets 22nd Street, and it all turns to gravel right there. Um, the steep hill? Very steep. <laughs> My dog doesn't even like to go. Up. Yeah. I know. When I walk, I have to go back I, and forth because I, well, I feel like I'm going to well, fall backwards. You walk up that hill, that's impressive because I don't think I can do it. <laughs> you, drive up, you drive down that hill without getting you into a wreck. That's a wreck. Yeah. We used to sled on that. As I say, sled ride. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think you can go away. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you, for that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Sure. So thank you. Yeah, thank we're looking you. for a consensus to move forward. Is that? Oh. Yeah. I think yeah. sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, okay. sir. Yeah. All right. Thank you all for the time and, and your input. Oh, yeah. so we're thank excited you. about it. We really are. Yeah, thank you for your work.
Last item on the agenda, Fire Department 2022 Annual Report. The Fire Chief Gary Birch. Mr. Mayor, Commissioners, appreciate the opportunity. I'm sure we can all do it. Not the department. Uh, we had three presentations before me that lasted about 35, 40 minutes. I, I promise to keep mine under 55 minutes. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we'll appreciate that. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> but, uh, we're kind of, you know, like we've already finished the first quarter, so I went ahead and did the 22 and a report, and we'll talk about that, and then I threw in some stuff for the 2023 for the first quarter this year. We've actually been pretty busy this year with fires and stuff. Uh, <clears throat> this will be also posted on the, our website and stuff going forward. Um, just kind of my message, you know, with the, the COVID years, 2021, prevented us uh, with, uh, it presented us with some uh, operational challenges. You know, people off, the sick themselves, uh, short, you know, short staff and people have had to go into quarantine and all that. So that was somewhat, but as far as running calls, you know, that's the operational thing and that's kind of what we do, you know, is we, we adapt, we adjust, we overcome, we, we get get the job done, whatever we're faced with. And so, you know, we got through that. Actually, uh, 2022 was probably the most challenging that I've seen because of our staffing shortages. Uh, you know, we went into the year a little short. Uh, we struggled getting applicants, you know, one or two applicants. Uh, and then we, we we actually lost, I look back, we, in 2022, we lost eight people that went to some other fire departments, you know. Uh, and I think, um, I'm hoping that that's, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Kramer had the finance director do some studies for us and the salaries and comparable salaries and stuff. And was able to, and I appreciate you all supporting that and bumping our starting salary up to be a little more competitive and stuff. So I'm hoping it kind of stops that bleed a little bit going forward. And, uh, you know, during that time, you know, we have a minimum staffing each day of 13. So anything below that, you know, uh, um, we have to hire overtime to cover that, to maintain our staffing levels. So we have to get into overtime. And when you're short staffed, you know, we still have to let people off on vacation, which we limit that. Um, and you can't always control, you know, we might have somebody that's off on military leave. We might have someone off on FMLA. We might have someone that calls in sick. So you can't always control that. So we have to hire overtime. And we, there's some people that don't work overtime. That's their choice. And there's some people that will work all they can. We kind of have a 72-hour limit on that just for you know safety reasons. If they put in 72 hours, they've got to, they've got to leave, and then they can come back later the next shift. Uh, but so we had actually, we got into, and, and, you know, uh, some of my guys has been around 25 years since the first time I've ever known this happened. We had to actually mandate people to work overtime. You know, we got in short, and we had to mandate them. Which created some issues. Uh, some didn't like it, but but we we knew that, and you know they wanted to start trying to change the way we did stuff. And bottom line, it was because we were short staffed. Yeah. We can change the way we're doing things, but we, we knew we just needed to get our staffing up. And right now we we we're back up, so we're doing good. Uh, but we just made some adjustments, kind of working with labor and management, talking and changed the way we did things. And we had a, a list. You know, we do things by seniority, so we had a reverse list. So if you were working, your name come up. You know, you got stuck with work, and so maybe you don't want to work tomorrow, but we just told you you have to work tomorrow. Uh, so what we did is if you volunteer to work, then your name moves down on that to the bottom of the, the mandate list. So we had people start working overtime that normally didn't work overtime because they can control when they work. So it really helped out just making those adjustments. But, but you know, and I always say, you know, when things get tough, the tough get going. It's kind of my singing. And even through all that, uh, this in 2022, uh, the morale seemed to really stay high with the guys. You know, they all stepped up to the plate. Uh, and there's a lot of things, and I'll show you some pictures here in a minute. But uh, these guys here that I work with is some of the best I've ever worked with. And I've been doing this a long time, you know. Uh, December would be 47 years I've been in this business. And, uh, you know, the guys, they, they take up on their own. They say, hey, see, we really need to jerk out them old bushes and do some landscaping if you'll buy the material. So I, when people offer to do that, <laughs> we always get the material. So they, they landscaped the stations. Uh, our our train tower out there has a fire hydrant, and around it there's no concrete. It was just a mud pit all the time. One guy said, "Chief, we sure sure could put a pad around that concrete, make it a lot better." 
you know, we'll do all the labor if you'll, if you'll pay for the concrete. So we did that, you know, and, and they come, some of them on their days off. Some of them do that kind of work anyway, so it, it turned out nice. And then I, some of our new guys wanted to build a roof prop, which you'll see a picture of that in a second, for training purposes. So we've got that out there now, and we've actually got some other departments, our neighboring departments would like to come and use it a little bit too, so we always welcome that. So that's just kind of a, what went on for our department challenges. And then also towards the end of the year, we switched over to our new record management system. So it, it kind of merged, which hurt us a little bit trying to figure out the numbers because most of it transferred over. And then we, you know, this we went to the executive time as far as our timekeeping in the city. So that's a new role for the battalion chiefs and stuff. And then we've also just recently did Vector Solution. And that's another software for training, but it also provides us where guys can go in and do their EMS CEUs and other kind of training too. And that's, that's something we always need to provide employees so they can have the opportunity to get enough CEUs where they keep their license. So... That kind of sums up 2022, uh, what we did there. <clears throat> the next slide there is kind of our mission statement, vision statement. And one of the things that uh, I like to say is, I call it the wow factor, and it kind of kind of falls into this. The fire service to me is the, the ultimate customer service business, because what we do is we help people. And I stress to the guys, it's not just when they dial 911, which they're having a crisis, we help them there. But any other things you see out there that people need help, you know, my guys have stopped and helped people with their, their flat tires. They've helped people, you know, an elderly person carry groceries to the car, and we encourage that. And uh, that's why we're there. And uh, just recently we see, received a letter uh, from one of our citizens. We had a, they had a fire in their home on uh, North 12th Street, and uh, they actually sent us a letter thanking us. But the guy showed up, put out the grease fire. That's what they do. So the 911 call gets us there. But then the wow factor, and the wow factor is, is she kept she kept expressing in her letter that our guy showed her a lot of kindness. You know, house had smoke in it. She was really talking about that, and why they had the door open trying to ventilate the smoke. Her cats got out, so they tried to assist with that. But she just went, went on and on about the kindness that the guy showed for that. You know, so uh, and we occasionally we get letters like that. So I was really appreciative that the guys did that. that that's our organizational chart. Uh, we've got. Uh, uh, 54 total employees with 54 uniformed employees uh, and it kind of breaks down the org chart. We have, we have three shifts and the guys they work a 24-hour shift so basically they spend a third of their life at a firehouse and it's a fire, I call it firehouse because they live there you know, live together, train together work together and so that's, that's that. We have, like I said we have 16 assigned to each shift we allow two off on vacation uh, and then that other spot, kind of a cushion if someone's sick or something of that nature, so that gets us down to the 13th. So you can see if we have vacancies, that I guess is there quicker. Uh, that kind of shows the city, uh, and I plotted out, those are a mile, a mile and a half ring around each fire station. Uh, the green at the top is station two, 10th and Shawnee, then station, the red is station one over on 20th, and then uh, station three, second avenue and limit, which that's the one that we're looking at replacing uh, next year. But it kind of shows you we got a little overlap in the coverage. And I know we're, we can't go move to the north, we can't go to the river, and we can't go south. If we ever did annex to the east, we, uh, the station one actually goes out there a little bit beyond that. Uh, when we got the ISO rating, one of the concerns was, was we had a quint there, which we didn't get counted for as the truck coming. So we... We've actually moved it to Station 2, so we did a little changing around to help with our eyes already, and I think it provides a better service also. There's a picture of the three stations uh, that we have. Uh, the one and two now, they were built in 2000, 2001. So, uh, they're starting to get a little age, you know, things like air conditionings and things like that, you know, repair. Our apparatus fleet, and I have a tendency to talk fast, so if you got a question, just throw your hand up. Okay. Our FRS fleet, uh, that shows the frontline units. Uh, we have four frontline units, four companies as I call it, three stations. Station two has two companies. And a company is a fire truck. It has an officer on it. We call a company officer, the rank is captain, a driver, driver operator, and then a firefighter. We run three minimum. So we have three engines and, a, and then a truck. And down at the bottom where it says aerials, uh, they cross-staff that. Both those trucks are sitting at Station 2. Um, and we have the cities divided up in zones, a lot of zones. 
And when the dispatch gives an address, it'll put it in a zone. Like they may say this is for station two, zone 201 or 101. And uh, those, that's the area that they're gonna respond to. <clears throat> the, the Quint, there's a 75 foot aerial and it responds uh, basically you know, like uh, EMS calls and things of that nature. Station two has the two companies. So the Quint goes anything west of 10th Street and engine two comes everything this side, thank you Paul, this side of uh, 10th Street. And of course, they both respond on fires and stuff. In certain zones, the downtown area, down, downtown here, and then out the 4th Street corridor, where we have the college and the VA, and all actually wrap around to, to uh, Walmart, uh, those zones there that the guys will jump, get off, grab their stuff off the Quint, and get over on the new truck, the area, and take it, the platform for that larger truck. So that's kind of how we're operating on that. Of course, we've got the two boats, and one thing I'll say, I went by today, looked at the river, because the Fort Leavenworth wants to do some training with this one on the river and the boats, and I drove down, and I think we could get in the water right now. That, that boat brand, the water's been down pretty low, so mm. we couldn't even get in there if we would have needed to, but I think we can get in there now. It's starting to come up a little bit with the rain, plus the snow melting up north. So we do that, and then also the, our hazmat trailer. One, we're one of the regional hazmat teams in, in the Mark region, so we work on the hazmat, we meet regularly and work with and get equipment, same as KCK, Overland Park, Olathe, Independence, Lee Summit, Blue Springs. Uh, so we, our guys train with their guys. So if we have something, we're gonna need everybody's resources and work together on that. <clears throat> One of the things that's not shown here, we also have a trailer that's got a lot of trench rescue equipment. There's a lot of construction going on, people digging sewers, water lines. There's always a uh, possibility of a trench collapse. I've been on several of those over my career. So we have shoring and stuff like that. If we ever have that, we have, that's another trailer that wasn't on the picture here. Any questions? Okay. Uh, the, the first quarter of this year, I just wanted to hit on that. Uh, we've had, in, well, April, January, February, March, up to April 1st, we had 767 calls, which average eight and a half a day. Uh, some days you may have less, some days you may have more, but it averaged that out. 32% uh, of those were EMS calls, oh, no, excuse me, 32 of those were actual fire calls, and 68% are EMS calls. Now, when I say fire calls, that's not necessarily a structure fire. That's any kind of, you know, maybe a grass fire, car fire, anything that's mm -hmm. fire-related, not EMS. Uh, we've actually had eight civilian injuries, somebody getting burned or hurt on, on fire type of calls, and no fatalities this year. So it just kind of gives a, gives a look there on that. Uh, what's the good intent call? Uh, someone needs some assistance, maybe a lift assist, okay. some of that nature. It, it, it gets, dispatched, gets dispatched out of something, but when we get there, it's maybe yeah. something a little different. Okay. And uh, like we may get a structure fire, but when we get there, it's food on the stove or a grease fire, so they'll coat it as that. Yeah. You know, yeah. To me, it's still a structure fire, but if you don't get there in time, it's going to be anyway. But uh, Yeah, and, and sometimes uh, good intent, too, is... Um, it could cat be someone burnt some That's toast. Cat the tree. Cat the tree. Yeah, well, we try to help out there when we can. Uh, but yeah, it could be you know maybe someone burnt some toast and they called us and smoke and we went there. It was a good intent. It wasn't you know uh, things of that nature. Under each one of those, and I got those you know the the one hundred two hundred listed, but under each one of those, there's probably. 30 different little yeah. other categories, so there's a lot of stuff under each one of those. Yeah. Uh, the 2003 calls also, just kind of give you an idea, on um, the left bottom there, it shows the calls per station. So as you can see, station two runs uh, more calls, but they've got two trucks there running those calls, splitting those up a little bit. And then, then I showed the calls per apparatus and uh, they cross staff, like I said, that Quint 2 cross staffs with Truck 2. That's why the Truck 2 only goes in certain zones. That's why that number's down. But that's the same mm -hmm. crew on those. Station 3, as you can see, by themselves are running you know, quite a few calls, too. 329, they're up there pretty good. So, anyway, if we didn't have that truck up at Station 2, they would, Engine 2 would be real busy, you know. Uh, which would probably, what happens, they'd be, there'd be times they'd be on another call and another call would come in. So we'd have to dispatch somebody from a little farther distance on that. So that's why it helps to have them be two units there. At the top, I got some of the, the, the national uh, response times, kind of the, 
best practices, if you will, on response times. And a response times uh, starts at the, the alarm handling. So when someone dials 911, he goes to the dispatcher and they ask the questions, what's your address, what's your emergency, things of that nature. And the national says that you, they should be able to, uh, and then the next step would be actual them hitting the button, which puts out a tone that we hear at the station and then we listen for the address. And so then we're on the clock at that point for what we call turnout time. Then when we get on that apparatus, that truck, and we say, you know, engine two responding, then we, or, then we go to the travel time. And then, and then the total time after that. So the, the national standard is that the alarm handling is a minute four. And, now, and uh, on an EMS call, uh, it's, it's a minute 20 because the dispatch is asking questions. Because we don't go on every single EMS call when they call for an ambulance. Mm -hmm. If they don't meet, you know, short of breath, uh, bleeding, you know, non-breathing, chest pains, we go on those calls. If someone's having a pain in their ankle or something, they use it, they don't dispatch us on that. The only time we would respond on something else like that is the EMS gets there and they need help with a lift assist, a large person or something. We go help them or they're down the stairs or something like that. But that's kind of how we are. Uh, last year was a little tough to get the numbers because we transitioned to that different software, so it, it made us a little struggle. So I just, I just listed our turnout time and the first travel time in 2002. You know, we encourage our guys to get on the trucks as quick as possible. You know, them tones drop. And then, uh, and, and actually last year we were using fractile times, which is a 90 percentile. So they took out the, the outliers from the top side and the bottom side and actually showed a higher number on the, on the drive time. This first quarter we just looked, we didn't do the fractile, we just looked at the average. Mm -hmm. and, and we're at a, a 132 uh, on turnout time. And so we're getting close to that national average. And then our, our uh, travel time is three minutes and 32 seconds. And I tell the guys, we're not driving any faster. Still going to do what we got to do, stop at red lights and stuff. It, you make up your time by getting on that truck. That's where you make up the time. So, uh, so far, we're turning pretty good on that. Then, you know, it, it's not that we're, everything's fast, fast, fast. It's just that, especially on EMS calls, you know, fires almost double in size every 20 seconds if it's got the fuel there. And then also, the EMS, if, you know, if someone stops breathing, you got four to six minutes before biological death starts to occur. Um, and so that, you know, time you get dispatched and get there on the road and stuff. And we're not always sitting at the fire station. You know, we got some other activities that, that we're out doing too, which brings us to this next slide. Um, in, uh, in 2000, uh, last year, we had a total of 3,096 calls, 131 fire calls, 42 structure fires, and 2,068 EMS calls. And that's 70, that was 72% of EMS. And one thing I'll say about the EMS calls, because I've been asked a lot over the years, well, you know, I, called, I called for an ambulance, you know, somebody needed to go to the hospital, and a big old fire truck showed up. Well, the fire truck... We're on that fire truck, so that's what we respond in. We don't have the staffing to send two guys in a little pickup truck or something to get there, and you know, and we got to go back in service. So we're on that truck and respond for a fire if we have to. But on of those two thousand calls, it's about a fit forty five to fifty five percent, about forty five percent, almost fifty percent that we actually get there first before EMS. You know, they're covering the whole county, even though they got two units here. You know, they go out in the county also. So, and that's. Pretty common, fire trying to get there within four to six minutes, EMS eight to nine minutes. So a lot of times we get there, we start the BLS, the CPR, the things we can do, stop the bleeding before EMS gets there. So that's kind of the system we work in, which is very common. Uh, fire inspections, companies go out and do fire building inspections. We did uh, 599 last year, which we're back up. That's about where we used to be before the COVID hit. Uh, fire hydrants in our city, we, we've got 1,353 fire hydrants. Uh, every, every, we, we try to, we actually, they supposed to drive by and do a visual and we got them divided up, much of cruise, get a visual on all and make sure it looks like everything's okay. A third of them every year they turn on and flush the water and we work in conjunction with the water department. They like us to do that because it kind of flushes out the, the gray water and stuff and cleans out, especially the dead end mains and stuff. So we work with them. And then also if our guys identify any repairs needed, they, you know, we get those turned into the water department also. Uh, our guys, if they see something, need to paint it, occasionally they'll go out and they'll paint the fire hydrants. 
uh, also. And I've even, you know, I've never heard of this till I got here, but you know, that's why I say the greatest guys in the world here. Uh, if it's not in someone's yard and there's an area where there's weed stuff, they've been known to go back out there at the weed eater and kind of clear the area a little bit. So uh, anyway, so that's good. Uh, mutual aid assist uh, in 2022, we, we gave, uh, we assisted other departments, be the Ford, <laughs> out the county, different to Easton, Kickapoo, and District 1, 28 times, and then we received assistance seven times. Mainly our assistance is when there's a fire, you know, uh, when we got all our units tied up. They'll either come to the fire or they'll come in to cover something for another call. And then last year we installed 59 smoke detectors. Uh, we had 22 community events that we, trucks went to, uh, nine schools and about 11 tours, which I think we have room to try to get get that out a little more and, and get those numbers up a little bit, you know, for public education and stuff. Uh, the next slide is kind of just a broad thing of training. It, it, that roof prop is at the top left. We actually had some guys build that, you know. We bought the lumber and they, they, they put that together. There's actually, you know, three pitches, kind of the flat part, and then the, maybe a 6-12, and the other side is pretty steep, about 11-12 pitch or so. So, you know, uh, put the ladder up there, learn to ventilate with saws and stuff when you're standing on that angle. So they do that. And we've already, you know, we've got people wanting to come from other departments and, and actually work on that. And I just kind of did a variety of stuff here. You know, we got the extrications. Uh, there's a tow lot in Easton that brings us cars to help uh, work on. Uh, the, the one below that's hazmat. We've had some people come in and do the chemical training and stuff, different hazmat. Uh, it, shows a, it shows the driver operator training there, two different <coughs> trucks, and then the, the trench rescue, the bottom. Uh, we had a guy come in, he actually dug a trench. One of our guys dug a trench out there, and we say we'll do the trench rescue class. We also, we do a lot of hosting. KU, uh, fire school, uh, we, you know, they, they want to give classes. So we encourage them to come down at, at ours. And the reason why I like that, one, I like us to do it. We get people, we've had people from out of state even show up to, to come to some of the classes that they signed up for all over the state of Kansas and the local area. But also it makes it easier for my guys. I don't have to send them somewhere, you know, where they're right here close. So I encourage, you know, the host, hosting our, uh, at our facility. And we've got a very nice facility down there to do that. And then uh, the community activities, you know, we're in the parades. Uh, we've been up on post a lot. They, their aerials always broke. They had to come and hold, put the flag up. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, you know, uh, and just, you know, the kids showing just, it's just a variety of things kind of give you an idea of what we do there. Uh, our color guards go, sometimes they get asked to go to funerals where someone's died in the line of duty stuff across the state and stuff. So we do that. Uh, the guys volunteer to ring the bell, Salvation Army stuff. And then station life. Like I said, the guys are at that station 24 seven, you know, uh, they got their morning chores, just like your house. They clean up and they clean the stations and all that sort of stuff. They they live there. They they eat there. They sleep there. You know, they do a lot of self training. Uh, one of the things before you can become a relief driver here, you got to learn them streets. You know, that's probably one of the toughest things they got to do is you know learning the streets and stuff. And uh, so it just gives you a little little insight to to what they do there. Shoot, I got nothing. <laughs> Good. Oh, no. <laughs> a great job. Definitely love the update. The only question that I have, uh, are you currently uh, recruiting at St. Mary's? No. Okay. No. No. No, I haven't been up there. Okay. No. Yeah. Well, great job. Yeah. Uh, and also, a special shout out to yeah, Section of, 3. Uh, yeah. The guys were amazing. They gave me and uh, one of the young men that helped out with the, uh, the spring cleanup, the tour, and he was just and all, so yeah. they loved it. They they were great. Uh, on on the recruiting, one of the things that that we require, we you know, and, and most departments in the metro are doing this. Mm -hmm. You know, when I when I say metro, I'm talking Kansas City. You know, big the, metro. Yeah, uh, the big departments like Kansas City, Missouri, Kansas City, Kansas, they kind of have their own academy. So you, you get hired with the GED or a, a high school diploma, good record, go down there, and they put you through 12, 18 weeks of training, EMT and all. Most all the other departments that we, you know we're not that large. We require you to have what we call fire one and fire two oh, okay. beforehand and hazmat. And that there's uh, several of the junior colleges do that. KCK does it. Uh, they they've even mentioned bringing it down here. You That'd know, be great. EMT, yeah. Uh, and then and then the toughest one's probably the EMT. You know, getting that. Uh, that takes a little bit longer, but that's we require that before we hire you. So that's okay. that's one of the things here. 
Yeah. Um, for the general public, I think, um, explain a little bit about the smoke detectors. I know you installed 59 last year, but um, you still provide the smoke detectors from the fire department and install? Y yes, we, we, we got a grant years back, which we purchased a bunch of them. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then we've had several people kind of take it upon themselves to go out and get some money donated to us from some of the businesses. Uh -huh. And uh, we recently had a lady come and, and donate $1,000 to us to, to buy. We, we, we got quite a few smoke detectors. We'll probably buy a few more, but we'd like to also get, we give little kids little red hats and stuff, so we would need to do some of that, that public education. So we'll probably spend the money on some of that stuff. And actually it was Walmart, it just dawned on me, who gave us that money. And one of the things is trying to figure out, because they got certain procedures and that finances got on, or maybe the city clerk on how to do that, how to actually yeah, get right. that money in there. So that's one of the challenges. But yeah, we do that. Uh, I, something I just thought about, and I several slides back, I'm going to go ahead and mention it is uh, on fire apparatus. You know, when we placed the order for in the 2016 to get the trucks with the three pumpers that we got in 2017, it was about a 12 12 month process. By the time we gave them a purchase order number, and for them to, to build it, and actually it only took them about a month to build it, but it, it took all that other for design and all that. Uh, when we ordered the aerial platform, I think that one was, mm, it was under two years. It took a little longer on that. Uh, now they're telling us it's it's 36 to 48 months oh, wow. to, to build one. Like the one we just, the one we ordered back like in about November, October, November oh, with ARPA funds, it's going to be about three years. Um, and one one thing that I was looking at, you know, they had the supply chain course in 2022, but now they got employee things, but also... There was an executive order on the federal level about emission standards to be in place, even eating, including diesel trucks and stuff, by 2027. So they've had mass orders, you know, that so they're going to be backlogged until 2025 on that. So uh, that's one of the things. And, you know, honestly, with <coughs> emergency service, it'd be nice if someone lobbied the feds and said, <coughs> exempt the emergency vehicles from all these yeah. emission standards, it's, you know, just... All the different things you got to do it and it's more things that break down on us too you know little sure, things sure. but so what we had to do in our planning because we're kind of like looking at we we try to do a 15-year replacement now uh when we presented the budget or when i talked to paul and, and uh, finance you know okay, okay if we want to replace one you know in 2025 you know we need to order it in 2023 we don't have to pay for it till we get it but i kind of had to work a spreadsheet and say hey i know we're not going to do to replace this and 2028, but we need to order that darn thing in 2025, you know, so it just had to change the way we're kind of doing stuff, so it just just had to make some adjustments because things are different now, you know. If we wait till 2028, it's going to be another three years old, you know, so so anyway. And our quint that we have, it's, that thing's got about 100,000 miles on it already, so, yeah, so anyway. Hmm. That's all I got. Uh, any questions or comments from the commission? No. Good report, thank yeah, you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner yeah. Martin? Yeah, oh, thank you. Uh, Pete Birch, I just, uh, I do want to thank you and your team. I, I, you know, I think it's, it's definitely evident that you've uh, tried to build a culture of a, a high-performance mentality. And, and I have to say, anytime you see any, any of your, your team, you know, that's going above and beyond um, what they're at, it's just it's reflective of the type of leadership um, that they have. And, and I just thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chief. All right, that concludes our study session. We'll go around the table, uh, starting with our city manager, Paul. Uh, nothing tonight, thank you. All right. Uh, Commissioner Martin, any anything you would like um, to say? Yeah, no, nothing on this side. Just wish everybody a great rest of your week. All right, Commissioner Hingler. Yeah, um, I received my postcard this past week on uh, the refuse choices to be made. Uh, everybody should be getting them by now. Please don't put it off. I mean, it does say, I think you have to have it in by the 31st of May. Don't put it off. Go ahead and do it now. If you don't want to have, if you just want to get your 95-gallon uh, uh, poly cart, you don't have to do a thing. But if you want to get the 65-gallon or if you want to uh, get none at all, you have to go ahead and follow the instructions on that postcard. Use that verification code above your name and address. Uh, go online and let your druthers be known so that uh, we can make that happen for you. Those are going to be delivered, I believe, in July. Is that right? 
I think that's right. Yeah, once we get all the orders and figure yep. out who's the morning one, we'll, we'll have a date. It's on your calendar. Yep. That and uh, y'all have a good week, two weeks. I'll be, uh, I'll be gone. I'm going to go to Poland, so. <laughs> but I intend to come back. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Vianor? No, I didn't have anything. No. The rain was welcome. I'm glad we're getting rain. And the master gardeners are out there working, and it's, everything's looking beautiful. So thank you to master gardeners for all of your mm -hmm. volunteer work to make our city beautiful. That's all I have. Yep. Uh, definitely want to give a special shout out to Parks and Recs. Uh, we had our grand opening this past weekend of the Splash Pad. It was a huge success, very well attended, and thank you for everyone that had a, a role uh, into the event. It was very successful. Families loved it. Uh, it was, man, it was just beautiful. Great time for the city. God looked at them, gave us some great weather, so that was very exciting as well, too. Uh, that's all that I have. That was a great time for you, too, Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> well, God bless you all. Yeah, and, uh, you all have a great week.